Hello and welcome to my channel where I talk about tips and tricks for teaching elementary music. Okay, let's get started. So before I get to today's video, I wonder if you have ever thought this. Oh no! I've taught the entire lesson and I still have 10 minutes left worth of class time. I don't know how I'm going to fill that time. Or maybe this. <sighs> I cannot seem to get the attention of my students. I keep trying and trying and trying, but they will not stay on task. What can I do to get them back on track? <sighs> well, in today's video, I want to give you some information to help you along the way. Today, I want to talk all about developing a bag of tricks. I'm going to explain further what I mean about that. So the bag of tricks that I'm talking about is not a literal bag like this. Instead, it is a collection of tools that will help you out along the way when you find yourself with extra time on your hands or students that are not paying attention. All right, here we go. I want to talk first about attention getters. So if you're going to find yourself in a situation where you are facing your class and you've created this great lesson and you've picked out music you think they're really going to like and activities that you think they're going to like, but yet they're just constantly talking or there's disruptions. Um, maybe a lot of people had to go to the bathroom and that's disrupted the class or somebody spoke out or you had to deal with a discipline issue. And all of a sudden, before you know it, your class is just off the rails and you don't know how to get them back on. The first thing I would suggest is doing an attention getter. Attention getters can be very short. They can be tailor made to you. I'm going to give you a variety of the attention getters that I use for you to try, or you can come up with something on your own. It's just a quick thing to kind of shift the mood in the room and get them back on task. For example, I discovered several years ago, this one, that I created on the spot because I was having trouble with my students paying attention. And I just went like this, everybody. And then I, and that got their attention right there because I was speaking a rhythm and I was saying it loud enough and I used the word everybody. So it's for all students. And I told them, why don't you copy me? So I did it again, everybody, everybody, please pay attention please pay attention and get quiet and get quiet. And it worked like that. And we were able to get right back on track. I have since used that particular attention getter to do all sorts of things, any directions that I want to give them. I will start with everybody and my students know when they hear it, that they just need to copy me. And they also know when I stop speaking in rhythm that we're done and you're done copying the teacher. I also use the everybody chance to line up my students at the end of the class time. It's just a nice way to close out the lesson. So that's one attention getter. Now there are times when my voice is a little sore and so I might go over to the piano that's in my classroom and just hit one, four, five, seven, one or arpeggiate or however you wanna do or just touch the piano in any way and my students have learned, oh, she's on the piano, we need to get quiet. If I happen to be close to another instrument and I wanna use that instead of the piano, like say this djembe, that's a really quick attention getter. It will get their attention right away. If you have been in an elementary school for very long, you have probably heard regular classroom teachers and administrators do something like this with the expectation that the students copy them right away. Because it's a quick little rhythmic thing to get the students in. You certainly could use that in your classroom. I would encourage you to change it up. When I see um, classroom educators or administrators do this, they do that same pattern every time. Until they feel that they've gotten their class back on track. 
Since we are music educators, it'd be a great idea to be like, and just change it up with all sorts of different body percussions. So that becomes an attention getter. It also becomes kind of an improv experience and a listening tool at the same time. So those are some examples of some attention getters. Using an attention getter is the best way to get those students back on track of that lesson so that you can continue on with what you had planned to teach them that day. Now let's talk about what you do when you have that extra 10 minutes or five minutes left over at the end of a class time. You've taught your entire lesson, they were paying attention, you got through it really quick, there weren't any interruptions, and all of a sudden you look at the clock and you've got all this extra time. So the first thing that I would encourage you to do is reteach. What I mean by that is, maybe you go back over a song that you sang, you know, go back over it again, or sing it a cappella, or just who can remember the words that were in this song. If you're talking, if your students have learned the treble clef recently, you've already gone over that, it's not a new concept to them, you could get that hand staff out. I liked this saying, elephants get big dirty feet. You could use whatever sayings you want. F, A, C, E for the space letters. And then for a review, you could hold up your hand and say to the students, okay, who can tell me what this letter name is? Who can tell me this one? Who can tell me this one? And just kind of go around. And then if you have enough time, you could say, turn to the person next to you. One of you hold the staff up and quiz the other one. And then after, you know, a minute or so, you could say switch. So now that person's the guesser and the other person's holding up their hand staff. So that's a quick way to fill up that time at the end of class. You could also go back over rhythms. If you've been doing so, um, a lot of rhythm reading that day, you could just go back and do some rhythm reading again. Or maybe you could just pick up a drum and do a little improv and have the students copy. I have a big drum in my classroom that's a teacher drum, and I sometimes, if I have enough time, I will sit down and I'll do like one measure, and then I'll go around the class in order of the chairs and say, okay, we're gonna take turns. If any, when I call your chair number, if you wanna come up here and do a one measure rhythm for us to copy, then you could do that. And the copying part for the people in their chairs, you can either do it with your hands, or you can do it on your lap, however you wanna do but you're just copying the rhythm. You could do solfege. This is all still part of reteaching. You could do solfege, just sit there and go, so me, so, so me, and have them copy. Pick up any patterns, do it, just make up patterns on the spot and have them copy. So all of those are great ideas to do the reteaching, but there are some times that you're like, you know what, they worked really hard and, they, and I think they got all of that lesson. And instead of reteaching anything right now, I'm gonna do something really fun that I don't always have the time to do with them. So that's when we're gonna go into silly songs. There are so many silly songs out there. There's, um, here's one that I used to do, that I learned in camp, and I think I've since discovered that it's a Girl Scout song or something. Um, about, I'm a little piece of tin, nobody knows where I have been, got four wheels and a running board, I'm a Ford, yes, I'm a Ford, honk, honk, rattle, 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 crash, beep, beep, honk, honk, rattle, 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 crash, beep, beep, honk, honk, rattle, 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 crash, beep, beep, honk, 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 and the idea behind that song is you teach it really slow first, and then you gradually increase the tempo over multiple times of singing it. So by the end, you go as fast as you can go, and I make a big deal out of it, and I say, okay, my friends, are you ready? We're gonna go as fast as I can go. You can either watch me or you can try it with me, and I'll be just ridiculously fast. Like, I'm a little piece of tin, nobody knows where I've been, and just make it go as fast as I possibly can go it and get all tongue twisted and everything, and I get to the end and I'm like, and the, the kids all laugh and think it's really funny. So, but there's many silly songs out there. Um, songs that you may have learned when you were a child, songs that you could Google. Just make sure that they're age appropriate. Make sure that the lyrics are still appropriate 
for common use because there are a lot of songs that may have been used 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that are maybe not appropriate anymore for children to be singing or anybody for that matter. But that song right there about just being a car and having different parts, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that. So now we're gonna get into one of my favorite. This probably is my favorite extra time fun activity to do. And that is reading storybooks. I love reading storybooks to my students. Usually in the month of August, I haven't done this in a couple years because I do have quite a big collection, but usually in the month of August, I will go walk into a bookstore and just go to the children's section and just kind of read the titles and walk by. Because I'm looking for things that um, I can sing to. I'm also looking for things that might have an element of music in the actual story, or I might be looking for something that is a really good book that I think I can have a music twist on it. So I'm going to show you some of the books that I have. So I mentioned that one of the things that I like to do is go walk through bookstores to find new storybooks. Another place that I like to find my new storybooks is in the book fair at school. And I always take the time to go in there and walk around and look and see what's there. And sometimes I will find something and sometimes I won't. So I want to tell you two of my favorite stories that I ever found at a Scholastic book fair. And I found them one year apart from each other. And that's important to the story as I show them to you really quickly. So we've got the first one, which is Frog on a Log. And this is by Kess and Gray and Jim Field. And, um, sorry, Kess Gray and Jim Field. And this whole story is all these animals sit on things that, that rhyme with them. And the frog is told to sit on a log and he doesn't want to do it. And by the end of the book, he asks the question, the cat is telling him who sits on what the whole time. And by the end of the book, he says to the cat, his very last question is, uh, what do dogs sit on? And as you might have guessed, since it's a rhyming book, dogs sit on frogs. And that's how the story ends, right? So it's very much like, wait a minute, what's going on? So the very next year, uh, I was walking through the Scholastic Book Fair again, and they made a sequel called Dog on a Frog and by Kess and Claire um, Gray and Jim Field. So the sequel, the frog changes the rules and he ends up at the very end sitting on something really cool that of course doesn't rhyme with frog and that's a lounge chair. <laughs> and, but the fun thing about having it be a two-parter is you can say, read this book this week and tell them, okay, what happened to the frog? He's underneath the dog. Sorry, but I do have a sequel and I can read it to you guys next week if we can get through the lesson and pay attention and we have time at the end of class. And that kind of motivates them to do that. Another book series that the students love. <laughs> this um, author and illustrator team, Lu Lucille, Calandro and Jared Lee have written a bunch of old lady who swallows a bunch of things that they can't, that they shouldn't be swallowing um, books. And the reason that I like these books is that there was a song that I knew when I was a, a student myself about an old lady that swallowed a fly, which is totally not appropriate to teach students anymore because it's, um, I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die, which is just, that's not appropriate at all to be singing a song about death. But um, these, this, these crazy old ladies swallow things like in this one, she creates a garden. So it's perfect for springtime. In this one, she swallows a bunch of stuff and creates like a sand castle. There's one for Halloween. There's one for the beginning of the school year. There's a scarecrow one. There's so many different um, books in this series. And a lot of the students will have these books or they'll check them out from the library quite frequently because they like it. Although all of your students may get it that this is not something that you go home and do, you want to make it very, very clear that you're not, you should not go home and swallow a frog, some dirt, some seeds, um, 
some gloves and a rake. You, you need to make that very clear that this is not how we create a garden, that this is just a work of fiction and, and all that. Oh, here's a little tip and trick. So um, students have a lot of, have a very hard time telling the difference between fiction and nonfiction. I'm not sure why, but kindergarten and first grade, it is part of their um, objectives in their regular classroom to know the difference between fiction and nonfiction. So you could actually help your classroom teachers out with this if you teach them this little song that I just made up, or you can come up with your own little song. And I, and I, it's one of those where I have the children listen and copy. So it goes like this. Fiction is fake. Fiction is fake. Nonfiction is not fake. So it must be real. Nonfiction is not fake, so is, it must be real. So the way that I teach it to them and I say, fiction starts with the letter F and fake starts with the letter F. So fiction is fake. Nonfiction has two first letters, N for non and F for fiction, and not fake start with N and F. So then we, you know, so I showed them those differences and then we sing it. And a lot of times before I read any book or maybe after I read the book so that they'll know what was in the story, I might say, is this fiction or nonfiction? And, and a lot of times they can tell me if we've kind of reviewed what the difference is between fiction and nonfiction. So these books right here that I just went over, none of them have a music um, connection. They're not topical, music topical, or sing songs. Although you could sing the song that goes with this one, which is, there wasn't a lady who swallowed a shell. I don't know why she swallowed the shell. She didn't tell. But now we're going to get into some books that have musical um, topics in them. So this one right here, Hilda must be dancing. So Hilda loves to dance, but as you can imagine, she's a hippo and she makes a whole bunch of messes all over the place when she dances and her friends want her to stop because every time she dances, she's like shaking everything and all like bananas falling from the trees and they constantly ask her to find a different hobby and she tries a bunch of different hobbies and doesn't like any of them. And finally, in the end, she figures out a way to dance that is okay with her um, her friends because it's not as noisy, but she still gets to have fun. And since she's a hippo, you might have figured it out. It's water ballet dancing that she gets to do at the end. So my students really like that story, and I like doing that too and making all the sounds when she's being really loud. I kind of stomp my feet and all that. Um, that's just one of many. This is a very, very small portion of my collection. I'm just trying to give you some ideas. So you could like, I think I found this one walking through a bookstore and I was just reading titles and I saw it. Hilda must be dancing. I was like, dance. That's a music, you know, music connection. Pulled it out and kind of read the story in the store and was like, I got, I'm getting this one. Okay. All right. There will be days when you don't feel well, but you're still at work, or when you, um, you, maybe your voice is a little tired and you have that extra five minutes after class or something and you wanna put a storybook in there, but you just don't feel like you have the energy to do it. So then you need to find storybooks and there are lots of these out there that have the CDs in them, okay? So this is one that I really like. This is um, Never Play Music Right Next to the Zoo. It's by the actor John Lithgow. And I like this because in addition to him telling the story, it also has the, the music playing in the background of the story that goes along with what he's talking about. Basically what happens in this story is this child falls asleep while he goes to a concert at that is next to the zoo. It's outdoors, an outdoor concert. He's with his parents, he falls asleep, and he has this big dream about the animals taking over. And they make all sorts of weird music when they take over. Um, anyway, it's, 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 a very, it's a very good story that my students like it, and it's a good break for your voice and just let the author himself and the, and the orchestra tell the story. 
So now I want to get to a book that is something that I discovered at a convention. And this is this has no music connection to it. It wasn't made for a song. The presentation that I went to, they were talking about music and literacy. They took this book and they turned it into a song. So it kind of opened my eyes up to ways that you could do that with a book that you find that you really like. One of the things I like about this particular book, Way Down Deep in the Deep Blue Sea, um, by Valeria Patron and Jan Peck, is the illustrations are so beautiful. And the kids really enjoy looking at that. And it's there are some repetition parts, so it's very easy to make into a song. And this is the way they did it. And I may have modified it since I actually heard it in the convention. Um, but it's like, way down deep in the deep blue sea. And then I have my students echo every single line. So it would be, way down deep in the deep blue sea. Way down deep in the deep blue sea. I'm looking for a treasure for my mama and me. Looking for a treasure for my mama and me. I'm so brave. I'm so brave. Can't scare me. Can't scare me. Way down deep in the deep blue sea. Way down deep in the deep blue sea. So you you do that and you will find that in the beginning you might have some intonation issues because this is all being done a cappella. You're just singing it and they're echoing you. But by the end of the book, any book that you do this with, they usually are right in tune with you and your over singers have kind of learned to blend and everything else. This is great for kindergarten and first grade. But the fun thing about this story is there's a little surprise ending. And at the very end, up, up, up from the deep blue sea, I find my mama waiting for me. Hello, mama. Guess what, mama? I found treasure in the deep blue sea. And you discover that all the time he was in the bathtub. And so I asked the kids, what what happened and i say he was using his imagination and somebody will say nation his imagination so it's a really fun thing and it just opened up my my eyes to being able to find stories that i really like the story to or the pictures to and being able to turn it into a song with your students okay that's all the tips and tricks i have for you for building up that trick bag don't forget to subscribe. Have a fantastic day.